I'm Old Big Land. This is the Inside Edge video blog. Okay, a couple of topics here I'm going to cover. I think you guys are going to enjoy this one. So I've done a few blogs on this in the past over the last five, six years. I also talk a lot, of, a lot about it in my book as well. How I've all, I'm always in the market. Always. I've always got my money working for me. You know, a lot of people have anxiety over investments or timing markets, markets in a bubble, whether that's real estate or the stock market. They worry about when they do pull the trigger on a house or a piece of property or a stock, you know, whether it's going to go up or down and losing money. Well, I don't worry about any of that stuff. What I worry about is having cash uh, that's idle, sitting around, not working for me. You know, as Kevin O'Leary uh, from the Sharks Tank often says, is that, you know, he looks at his, and I agree with him, I look at my money as a soldier, as a worker, every dollar. And I want my money out there working, hustling, and making me more money. My biggest fear is having my money sitting at home watching TV and sleeping all day. And that's what happens when you're in cash for long periods of time. So I had a, a viewer, and I've had this question a few times. It was a good question by one of my long-term uh, uh, subscribers, saying, "Oh, and just uh, you know, wanted to know if if we had a 10 or 15 percent correction in Vancouver real estate downtown, let's say, would you be a buyer of another investment unit?" And I told them, "Absolutely, yes, I would be a buyer." But I'll go one step further, and I've talked about this many times before. I'm always systematically buying investments. Uh, whether that's in the stock market, which I'm going to talk about, as well as investment properties. So I've done blogs on this. Uh, the last investment property I bought was coming up now to about four and a half years. I did a, a multi-part video on what I bought. It was an Olympic Village uh, condo. It was pre-sale, but wasn't really pre-sale. It was built by Bastion. Uh, it was tangible product. Uh, you could buy it, uh, and six weeks later, the building was almost complete. You could move into it. And I bought uh, one myself. I also got several of my clients into this. And it's turned out to be an incredible investment. I, at the time, I paid, this was just five years ago, 368000 brand new, one bed, one bath, no parking. Um, that unit now is up substantially. If I use the leverage factor on that, I'm probably up close to 300% on that investment in the last five years. So it's been really nice. But uh, the, the, I've told people, I kind of systematically are buying every three, three and a half, four years. I've been doing that for 30 plus years now. My other purchase was a principal residence that I bought here in the West End, downtown Vancouver. I bought this just over three and a half years ago. Uh, and then I did a substantial renovation to it. That probably would have been the money for another investment unit. But uh, I spent, you know, well in excess of $250,000, $300,000 to do the renovation on it. So now I am getting ready uh, to pull the trigger on another property. It's time. And I said to this guy, you know, it, it's irrelevant whether the market goes up or down here over the next six to 12 months, because that's kind of my window. I'm just getting ready to put my pre-approval together. And when the right unit comes up, uh, I'm going to pull the trigger on it. If the market goes up five or 10% here over the next six to 12 months, no problem, fine. If it's the right fit, the right unit, I'm going to buy it. If it goes down 10 or 15%, hey, I look at that as a bonus. Fantastic. But I'm going to buy either way. And I always pounded that home here. You guys should do the same thing. Once you're qualified, you've got the money, it's, especially if you're buying your principal residence, pull the trigger and hang on to it. Because I could care less if I bought this investment unit six months from now and two years from now it was down 10%. It would make no difference to me whatsoever. Zero. Why would it? I've got a tenant in it. I'm collecting the rent. I'm using the leverage. It's a fairly simple process. So here's my thinking on this. Uh, it's First off, buying another investment unit for me, it's just the right time. The stock market uh, is, as I speak right now, at all-time highs. My portfolio has never been higher. Um, now, mind you, I am always still nibbling on stocks. Pretty much every week I'm buying something because I've got a lot of dividend flows coming in every week for me, for me from my portfolio, and I've got a large portfolio. So I'm getting enough fresh powder in there pretty much on a weekly basis to buy 100 shares of this or 100 shares of that. So, you know, there's always something that, for me anyways, that it makes sense to purchase. Um, you know, I was loading up on stuff earlier this year. Of course, I talked about it last year. 
you know, I probably would have bought another investment unit last year in 2020, but the stock market, there was so many opportunities in the stock market. Uh, I was putting every dollar I had, excess dollar, straight into the market, buying companies like FedEx and Apple and Amazon and Johnson & Johnson. Geez, the Canadian banks, Bell Canada, I was putting money into. And we're up, you know, well over, I'm up anywhere between 100 to probably 150, 175%. The timing was right. Now, S&P 500, TSX are at pretty much all time highs. Again, I'm still nibbling on those, on stock. And I'm under the belief, hey, even if I don't have a compelling buy uh, as far as an individual US equity, I'll just throw it into the index. XEI is one of my favorites, which is the Canadian, iShares Canadian High Dividend. Uh, they pay that dividend monthly. It's running at about four, four and a quarter uh, percent yield right now. So far superior to what you're getting in a savings account. Uh, XIC is another Canadian index. I'll just put the money in. The S&P 500 or VIG, or geez, if I've got nothing else to buy, I'll just buy some Bell Canada. Um, you know, Bell Canada is still yielding five and a half percent right now. It's, you're not going to hit any home runs on it as far as uh, capital appreciation, although it's up substantially the last year, but it'll pay you that nice five and a half percent yield all day. And they're continuing to grow that dividend. TELUS would be another one that's in there as well, but any of the Canadian banks. So those are at 52 week highs now. Now is the time to maybe parlay some excess money now and buy another property, investment unit, it's time. So the big advantages to this are now, of course, again, the price, whether the market's up or down, I'm still gonna pull the trigger. For me, it's about the leverage and I've done many blogs on leverage and the power of what leverage can do for you. It's the greatest wealth creator we've got. So give you an example, I'm gonna put down, I'm gonna get ready, just working it out with my banker right now, I'm gonna ask for a $750,000 mortgage and I'll buy something in and around there, probably 675 to 750, downtown one bedroom condo. I'm gonna put 20% down and borrow the other 80% at a very favorable interest rate. Let's call it 1.7, 1.8, 1.9%. Very close to historic low interest rates. It's the leverage really that's the wealth builder here. And just to keep it simple here, very simple uh, example. You buy a $100,000 condo today. You put 20% down, which is what you're gonna have to do. You're gonna have to take out a conventional mortgage, 20% down. So you're gonna put $20,000 down, borrow the other 80,000 at 1.8% to purchase this $100,000 condo. Let's say in five years, the value of that condo goes up 20% from 100 to 120,000. 120, Very easy to do. A lot of people would look at that and say, hey, you've earned a 20% return, not bad. And when actuality, it's a 100% return. You have doubled your money in five years on, a, on that 20% increase because you've only got 20,000 of your own dollars in there and now the condo is worth 20,000 more over the last five years. That's a $100,000 return. That's what leverage does. But of course, leverage is incredibly misunderstood by people. They, as soon as you start talking about leverage, people automatically, people that don't have any money, of course, and are just bitter and angry, uh, they will tell you that you're, oh, it's very risky. You're taking on a lot of debt there. What if the condo goes down 10 or 15%, then what? Well, then what is nothing? First off, the banks are not gonna let you over leverage in Canada. They are a very stringent gatekeeper on this. Anyone that's tried to apply for a mortgage and get pre-approved can attest to that, as I've been saying for decades here on my blog. You know, they are not cavalier lenders and you never wanna overextend yourself and the banks won't let you do it anyways. Any real estate purchase I've often said should be done with a long-term horizon. You're not a flipper here. You're gonna buy this property, put a tenant in it, and hopefully hold it for 10, 15, 20, 30 years or more. As you guys know, I've got properties coming up to 35 years that I've held. I've got several others that are well over 20 years that, I've, that I'm still holding. I don't sell much. I do sell the odd property over the years, but when I do, it's usually to consult, consolidate and buy other properties. But that's where I'm at right now. 
you know, I'm still buying and putting money to work in the stock market, absolutely. Still maxing out my TFSA and RRSP in early January every year. And there'll still be good windows for buying and, and putting money to work in the, in the equities market. But the time is right now for me to get out another mortgage for, let's call it 750K. I'll put 160, $170,000 down and borrow the rest. Take advantage of that leverage. And I am not over leveraging. As a matter of fact, when it comes to debt, this is where people get all confused. I've got several million dollars in mortgage debt right now. And a lot of people might think, boy, you must have a hard time sleeping at night. And I don't whatsoever, because I could easily cut a check right now and pay off all that debt. But why would I? I've got, these are all on investment properties. All the interest is deductible. Uh, the income that I'm getting from my tenant, I can deduct the interest on the mortgage, the property taxes, the maintenance fee, and any repairs. This is leverage, and this is how you're going to create wealth. But again, it's taboo to some people. You have to learn about how leverage works. I'm gonna do another blog on this, and I've done many on this, but it's time for another one on leverage, how wealthy people think towards debt, and how poor people think. Uh, when it comes to debt because there was just a very good multi-day article on the Wall Street Journal on this and I'm gonna do another blog on that but that's where we're at the other thing I'll tell you too is where am I gonna get my down payment funds from because this guy was a so I what I what I'm gonna do I would let's say I'm gonna put hundred and seventy five thousand dollars down to buy this seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar condo so we'll call it a 20% down or so probably use some new cash and um, you know cash that I've got readily available let's call it 50k but the other 100k uh, I don't keep cash again as I said at the beginning of the blog sitting around idly in a checking account or a bank account or a term deposit earning me zero as a matter of fact it's losing me money but uh, what I will do is I will just simply sell my cash accounts really now are XEI or XIC or VIG or just Bell Canada and tell us. Um, I'll keep my money in that, collect my five and a half, six percent yield, which is 10 times better than what you're getting in a bank account. Bank accounts aren't paying you anything and it's also taxed at your, uh, it's not tax efficient. Canadian dividends are. So I'll just sell 50,000 of Bell Canada and maybe another $50,000 of XEI, uh, which by the way, XEI pays their dividend monthly, which is nice and that will form my down payment to purchase the next unit. It's a nice situation to be in for me. Most people can't do that, but it's something you guys should try and attain eventually. Try and set your goals to, to be where I'm at. Most people do need to keep an emergency fund in cash, or when they're saving for the down payment for a home, they've got to keep it in, uh, in some sort of a fixed income, interest-bearing vehicle which isn't gonna pay you really nothing. You're actually losing money on it with inflation, but you can't afford the risk of losing your capital like you can with being in equities. But that's a risk I can take. I've got a big enough portfolio and enough assets so I can keep my money in those kind of things that are paying me 5% yield plus potential another two or 3% in capital gain over time, which Bell Canada and the Canadian banks have definitely done here. So I'll just redeem $100,000 in stock and use that. You guys, of course, or a lot of young people starting out aren't gonna be able to do that. But that's the, the long-term goal that I've been talking about here for the last decade and I talk about it in my book. It's a slow, methodical process here. You're not gonna notice much in the way of gains or getting ahead in the first 10 years. But after 10 or 15 years, you're maxing out your TFSA and RRSP, you're building up uh, uh, you know, equity in there and you're getting dividends coming into you every week and every month. Then it's, it's almost you lift a veil there and you can kind of see where we're going at with this. So that's where it's at. I'm gonna do another blog here, a follow-up blog on this on rich versus poor man thinking, how leverage works, the difference between good debt and bad debt, which I've done tons of blogs on, but I have to pound that home because it's one of the things I see so many people get tripped up on, on mortgages and taking out a mortgage. Uh, you know, the Canadian government, of course, is obsessed, obsessed with the interest rates and people buying homes. Uh, take Evan Sindel, for instance, borrowing at 1.7% to buy a home. 
when they don't talk anything about consumer debt, for instance, credit cards at 25 and 30 percent. Do you ever hear much talk about curbing that? Never, even though it's loan sharking. But yet buying a house at 1.6, taking advantage of the principal residence exemption and taking advantage of the leverage, you know, that's taboo to a lot of people. I'm Owen Big Len. As always, thanks for watching. Thanks to all my new subscribers. I'll see you next week.